Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vnchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vnchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to 757 230 2110. You know, it's hard to travel. You know that, right? It's hard to travel and be a good person. Anybody experience that? Were you trying your best to be nice and friendly? But the flight in today, I'm on the window seat. The plane was packed. And it's not the man's fault. He's a big man. The seat is little, but he had to sit right next to me. <laughs> and he's pouring into my seat. It's not his fault. <laughs> but before we even get in the air, he falls asleep. And by the time we're up in the air, he's snoring, and his head is on my shoulder. <laughs> he's dead asleep. And I start elbowing him to get, me, get him off of me. And then I heard in my heart, what would Jesus do? <laughs> Man, I didn't know Jesus flew southwest. <laughs> kept hearing, what would Jesus do? Then I thought about it. I was like, man, Jesus raised the dead. So I looked at him and said, wake up! <laughs> he got up. Well, that is what we want to do is ask what Jesus, what would Jesus do <clears throat> as we go into these next two weeks where we're going to be talking about serving, how to serve the world. And specifically, we're going to be talking today about serving through Jesus' eyes and what he learned, what we can learn from his teachings. It's your serve is what the uh, message title is today. Now, we were, we actually, we had like 100 people uh, from our church go and help serve people down in Myrtle Beach. We did a regional conference. Uh, many people took uh, time off from work to drive down. Obviously, they got refreshed in the process, got encouraged by God's word, but also served because uh, we're, this church here is the, uh, serves, serves the Mid-Atlantic region of, uh, of the Vineyard Movement. And so we're able to serve there. And when we do that, that is a way of loving on people. When we serve, we love. Notice it says, serve one another humbly in love. Those two words, circle, serve and love, because they really go together. Certainly you can serve without loving, but you cannot love without serving. Whenever you, there is a need, somebody who is loving will help meet that need when they see it, when they're aware of it. And certainly that's a big part of what we do. You know, I think that serving <clears throat> is a little odd in a way because, you know, I mean, I'm all for serving, actually. I, I think it's great. I'm a big champion of serving. I think that uh, when I read it in the Bible, I'm all, I'm pro-serving. I love to teach about serving. I love to read about serving. I love to hear stories about serving. But when I go home and it's my turn to serve, I don't want to serve. Are you, you know what I'm saying? I mean, it's kind of like, no, I want to be served. Our human nature is like that. I want to be served. I don't want to serve. And so we, we have to kind of like step out of ourselves sometimes and that's why it's so important to be encouraged by what Jesus says. You know, he, he can teach us a lot about how to, how to serve. Serving can be very hard because, again, it's kind of counter the way we're wired. We're tending, we tend to want to think of ourselves first. But serving is so important. It helps our friendships. When we serve, it helps our, our, our marriages. If you're married, to serve. It helps in the workplace to have an attitude of, I'm here to serve 16 times, you know, in the Bible, in the Old Testament, it says God serves us. He's our servant. Now, normally we don't think of it like that. We think of, you know, God's majestic, and he is, and he's the almighty, and he is. But he calls himself, he refers to himself as our servant. What a great role model. And certainly Jesus did that as well. He came not to be served, but to serve. And so certainly we can learn a lot from that. I think serving is kind of almost like, Learning a language, you know, learning to serve, learning to serve well. If you were born, if you were born in a household where there's <clears throat> more than one language and you're bilingual or trilingual, maybe it was easy for you. But for for many people, when when we're just when we have one language we're raised with, and then we have to learn, like in middle school or high school, another language, it's it's pretty challenging. It's pretty challenging. They say Chinese is the hardest language of all to learn, Mandarin. I really think the hardest language. 
is the language of serving, the language, the loving language of serving. It's very, very difficult. Jesus, of course, was fluent in that language, but yet it was the hardest thing for him to teach. We just see him teaching different lessons, but over and over, he's, it, it seems like it was not always getting through, no matter what he did, in order to teach people to serve. But when we serve, it has a huge impact, a huge impact on people around us. In Dale Carnegie's book, How to Win Friends and Influence People, if you could really summarize that book, it's learn to serve, be a servant. When you learn people's names, it's you're serving them. When you listen to people, it's a way of serving them. When you uh, sincerely make people feel important, it's serving them. When you smile, even when you don't want to, that's a way of serving. When you give people honest, sincere appreciation, that's a way of serving. So what I want to do is just look at two, two, two of Jesus' teachings in particular and, 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 and how they teach about serving. The first one is actually a very interesting story. It's kind of strange and certainly the least popular of those parables uh, there in Luke 17. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Luke 17. If you... Uh, uh, or turn on your Bible, however you get to the, you know, uh, Luke 17, there, beginning in verse 7, it says, suppose, Jesus says, suppose one of you has a servant plowing or looking after the sheep. Will he say to the servant when he comes in from the field, come along now and sit down to eat? Won't he rather say, prepare my supper, get yourself ready and wait on me while I eat and drink? After that, you may eat and drink. Will he thank the servant because he did what he was told to do? So you also, when you have done everything you were told to do, should say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. Now, this story looks odd to us, but in the context of where Jesus is talking in this working relationship of his day, uh, that, that was, those were expected things to do. That was, that's what he was paid to do. Kind of like if you were to update it for, to make sense to us, it would be like if you said, uh, you know, you were, you're, you're married and, you, you know, you've got kids and you, if one of you comes home. Let's say you both come home at the same time and, the, 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 you know, the, the house is a mess. The kids have gotten into stuff. That's all, all you know, messed up and dirty and, and uh, the toilet's backed up. And you go in and you uh, change your shirt and you come back and you say, hey, I changed my shirt. I took care of me. So let's, you go ahead and do the rest of that. And then why don't you cook me a steak for me changing my shirt? You go, hey, I'm not, you got this all wrong, you know. Or if you're an employer and, uh, and your, your employee came in and said, hey, listen, uh, I commute here uh, and I got here, I got here okay and on time. I get to my desk. I, I'm sitting here. I, my shoes match and my computer's on. I think I deserve a break. Uh, if I actually need a raise, uh, you so-called boss. I want you to do some of my work for me while I chill a little bit because I got here on time. My shoes match. You get, no, wait a minute. You're not. No, no, that's not how it works. You know, this idea of, of Jesus is, is, is uh, saying, hey, if you have this idea of entitlement, of an attitude of ungratefulness, that's what he's addressing here. And he does it actually very cleverly because see the disciples like everybody but the disciples in particular we read in the bible were struggling with this idea of serving in fact they're always kind of negotiating who's the best who's the greatest we see this over and over i just have one of these uh examples here in luke 22 it says a dispute also arose among them as to which of them was considered the greatest here they are they're jesus's disciples Jesus is the greatest, but they're, they're deciding among themselves, who's the greatest? Jesus said to them, the kings of the Gentiles lorded over them, and those who exercised authority over them call themselves benefactors, but you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest, and the one who rules like the one who what? Serves. Yeah, like the one who serves. And so, in the story we're looking at, Luke 17, Jesus begins by inviting them to imagine you're in charge, you're the master. You know, you're not a servant. He goes, no, yeah, okay, you guys, you're always talking about who's greatest. Picture your, you can afford servants, you have servants. And so that's what he's, he begins with is, is says, you know, you, you're, uh, you, have, uh, you have servants. He says, so um, 
you, you have this idea in your mind, you know, that I'm in charge, and yet they're just doing, you know, the basics. They're just, somebody's just doing the basics. You're not going to give them all these accolades and all this. You're, and then he says, then he reverses it, and he says, now picture you're the servant, and then he says, so you also, when you have done everything you were told, to, you should say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. He says, now, you know, you're, you guys are the disciples. I'm the master. Now, when he says unworthy servants, he's not saying they have a poor self-esteem. He's just saying that they recognize that they've just done what was expected of them. They shouldn't expect anything extra. And he goes, hey, this is, this is what it means. And that's, that's the attitude of servanthood. He says, hey, I don't serve just so that I can get a whole lot out of it. I don't want to hear, we're going to serve on this coming Saturday together. It's not so that everybody's going to praise us. Wow, you're amazing. You could have done something else with your Saturday morning, but instead you come and you serve us. That's not, that's not what we're doing it for. We're doing, we're, that's what it means to be a servant. And you just do it without all of that recognition. Uh, Mother Teresa said that the reason she served the poor was for the joy that came from it. I mean, it might have been heroic at one point where she was rescuing and doing something to me, but after a while she just discovered, no, it's, that's, that's what the character God's developed in me is this joy. Dallas Willard, who was, used to teach on spiritual disciplines, said that one of the evidences of our, serve, of our growth as a servant or in our spiritual journey is, is that we... Uh, we don't even think of it anymore. We don't even think of ourselves or think of what we're doing as much. It would be like an alcoholic when they first, uh, when their first day of sobriety, they're probably thinking about it all day long. You know, all day long, wow, I'm sober. I can't believe it. I'm so, it's so hard. But after 20 years of sobriety, it's kind of like, uh, this is what it means for sanity for me. I, and, I, and they have gratefulness, but they're actually freed up to think of other things than just all day long about how hard it is to stay sober. And so when you first step out and you start honoring God with servant, with servanthood, at first you might be, God, are you watching? Look at what I'm doing. Kind of like, you know, some guys, you know, first time they do the dishes, you know, they can't wait till their wife sees them. The dishes are done, you know. And they want a drum roll and, the, whoa, look at me. But as we step into greater levels of maturity, it doesn't have to be like that, right? We just do the dishes because they need to be done. We don't, we're not looking for a bunch of, you know, recognition. And that's what it means to, Jesus is saying, to step into servanthood. And maturity means we're just saying, this is what it means. This is what it means to be, to be a follower of Christ. A little over 20 years ago, a guy named Gary Chapman wrote a book, The Five Languages of Love. He kind of took all these expressions of love and grouped them into categories. And he said, you know, I see five. Five categories. Any, any aspect of how you love in a practical way can be found. Can, you can kind of slot it in one of these categories. And here they are. Quality time, receiving gifts, acts of service, physical touch, and words of affirmation. Certainly, those are all languages of love. And so I took this next story we're going to look at with Jesus, and we're going to pull out these five aspects of love. Number one is quality time. Quality time. It says there, now this is in Luke 7, so you can just flip, over, flip back a little bit to Luke 7, and then it says, when one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. So this is quite a, quite a scene, actually, in this, in this uh, story that happens. Jesus is very busy, and yet he carves out time for this guy. He's a Pharisee. His name's Simon. And we find out in the story that he has zero respect for Jesus, that he doesn't even like Jesus. But yet Jesus, in his hectic, busy schedule, still carves out time to go to this guy's house and have dinner with him. Certainly a very loving act. So he, goes, he does that. He goes to Simon's, Simon's house. And uh, Jesus, as the visiting rabbi, would have been uh, considered the honored guest. The honored guest. And the honored guest in, in those days had certain customary uh, gestures 
of hospitality that would have been bestowed upon any honored guest that comes in. One would be just a greeting, right? I mean, we do that in our society. We just greet somebody. You recognize they've entered into the room. You might even shake their hand. Well, in that day, their greeting was to kiss, to give them a kiss. Now, if it was somebody that was deemed of equal social status, you would give them a kiss on the cheek. But for like a parent to a, to a, to a, to a excuse me, a child to a parent or to a student to a rabbi, something like that, where there was a higher social status, then often you would kiss their hand. You would kiss their hand as a, as a sign of respect. But it gets some kind of, 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 that was, you know, some kind of greeting. There was a recognition, because in their, and that was very important, because in the ancient Middle Eastern culture, that kiss was, was a recognition, you're here, and I recognize you, and uh, it was, it was, a, it was an, a very important. Uh, it, it, not doing that was equivalent to completely ignoring somebody. Then there was washing somebody's feet because it was a dinner. So if you had a meal together because it was very dirty, they wore sandals. It was a very it was custom to customary to always have uh, somebody's feet washed. Now again, if they were of somebody of higher social standing, then usually the the uh, the the uh, the person's home they would wash their feet themselves. But you could give it off to a servant. You could also just give them their own basin of water and just say, wash your own feet, but that would be considered somewhat disrespectful to do that, but certainly better than, than nothing. Then you'd also common to give them some kind of olive oil uh, to put on their head and maybe in their hands because it was a very dry climate. All of these were expected. Now, this guy, this Pharisee, Simon, does none of it. And they're not subtle omissions. They are... They're, they're, they're obvious points of neglect that he did. And so it was like a slap in the face to Jesus. So the tension, because of the Pharisee, is very, very thick in the house. And then into the story comes this new character, this woman. Uh, in those days, banquets were kind of like public affairs. They didn't have uh, windows and air conditioning. It's all sealed up like we do today. Back then, it was, it was open air. And often, the, the, the dining situation took place in the courtyard. People would walk by. They would stop. They would listen. They would watch. And so this gal, she gets into her mind. She's going to go there. Now, certainly, she would not have been invited because she was a sinner. She was a prostitute. And the whole town would have known that. So she's not going to be on the guest list. But she comes into her mind, I think I'm going to go. Now, we know from Matthew's gospel that earlier that day, she had, she, Jesus had been teaching on, on uh, a number of things. One of the things he says in his teaching earlier that day is, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Certainly, she would have been there. The Bible says she, earlier she had been uh, listening to Jesus. I bet she, as, she, as she listened to those words, she just thought, what about, you know, that's an invitation to me. Maybe she never felt invited or loved by somebody before, but she listened to Jesus' teaching. She maybe just started thinking about her life. How did I get here, she probably thought. You know, this is no young girl's dream is to end up like that. That's, that's not a dream. No, she was a baby at one point, and, and the object of, of her mother's love and the dreams of her mom, that's not... Certainly the, the dream moms have for their, for their daughters. She probably just thought, you know, how did I end up? Maybe, maybe she was uh, rejected by her husband, and this is the only way that she could support herself financially. But if this, you know, listening to Jesus, somebody looking at her, loving on her, giving her a promise of hope, she probably just thought, you know what? I, there's, Jesus has words of hope. I'm going to go see him. I don't care what anybody else says. She was probably afraid, filled with fear, feared with excitement, filled with excitement. Go, I'm going to go. And she grabs a, uh, this uh, alabaster jar of perfume. Would have been part of uh, a tool of her trade for sure. But she brings it and, it, and she seems to be bringing it as this gift to Jesus, which goes to the second language of love, gift giving. Here we pick up the story with this woman, a woman in the town who lived in a sinful life, learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. 
So she came there with this alabaster jar of perfume. So that term, you know, jar could be uh, as common in a flask, but it was very expensive perfume. The jar it's in is a very expensive jar alabaster, kind of like marble, but even more easier to, to carve, easier to work with. And so she gets this and she thinks, I'm going to go give this to Jesus. She's probably thinking, I don't know how, I don't know how it'll work. Uh, she doesn't know if she'll get rejected. You know, she's had a life uh, filled with, with, certainly with lots of rejection, but her overwhelming love and, 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 and devotion to Jesus, she goes and she, 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 she stands out there in front of, in, in the courtyard. Now she is watching this stuff going on with, with Simon the Pharisee treating Jesus so poorly. And certainly this mixture of, you know, devotion to Jesus and now anger, she decides, I'm going to step into this thing. And so she walks into the courtyard, walks right into where they're having dinner. Now, certainly all the eyes would have been on her and knowing that here's this prostitute coming in, wasn't invited, breaking protocol, breaking a breach of etiquette. And she walks right in and she stands and then kneels next to Jesus' feet. And that goes into these next two that we see, these next two gifts of uh, languages of love. Physical touch and acts of service. Physical touch, acts of service. And here as we see this. It says, as she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. Now, of course, she can't come in and she saw that he didn't get a kiss, but she can't kiss Jesus. That would be way too presumptuous. People Think of what people would think. They know her profession, and they would interpret it a certain way. And she can't wash his feet, but I think as she's just standing there over his feet, she just starts being overwhelmed with the fact that she's been forgiven by God, as she heard Jesus' message earlier, that she is, has new hope, that Jesus treats her with dignity, that, she, that he looks at her with a look of love, not like other men, but this one is out of respect and who she is and as a friend, as a daughter. And I think she just wells up and just at first just a couple tears come and then all it just starts flowing and just down her face all over Jesus' feet. And then she thinks, well, I need to kind of, you know, I made a mess on his feet. I need to clean it up. But she can't ask Simon for a towel. He's not going to give her a towel. So she lets her hair down. Well, in that culture, women never let their hair down. It was considered very, very provocative, so much that men couldn't handle it. In fact, if you were, uh, if, as a married woman, if you let your hair down in mixed company, that was grounds for divorce in that day. And so women just did not do that. And so she lets her hair down what she had done many, many times with other men. But this time, for the final time and for the right reason, she lets her hair down and she wipes Jesus' feet with, that are covered with her tears. And then she pulls out this expensive perfume. And it certainly, as I said, was a tool of her trade, but then she just empties it on him. That's her life, and she's, she's, she's done with that. She, she empties it all. She, she, Jesus is a, is a guest of honor, a holy man. She wouldn't be able to, she's not, uh, it would be way too presumptuous to pour it on his head. So she pours it on his feet. All of this, Jesus is, is lying there because in those days they didn't have chairs when they sat down. He would have been reclining. His feet would have been behind him. And, and so here you have this, this, this moment. And then Simon is watching and he's going, this is not turning out at all how I expected. He had his own ideas. And so it says, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. So he thinks to himself, hey, he, this guy must not be the guy I was thinking of. If he was even a prophet, he would know what kind of woman this is, that, and he wouldn't let her touch him with a 10-foot pole. And so Jesus tells this little story. He says, Jesus answered him, Simon, you have something, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. And now 
and it says two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii, the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back. So he forgave the debts of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Kind of an interesting twist there. I mean, talking about loving money lenders. Which one would love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one that had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. So he says, so somebody owed a little bit amount of money to a money lender. Somebody had, you know, this fortune that they owned him. Neither of them could pay. They were both forgiven. Who would re respond and love the most? And, uh, and so Simon says, well, certainly it's the one who was forgiven the most. And he goes, you know, you've judged correctly. And so this leads to the fifth language of love, the words of affirmation. Words of affirmation. Now, this is really one of the most interesting conversations we read in, the, in all of Scripture because up until this time, Jesus and Simon are talking. Everybody's around. People are watching in uh, outside the courtyard. And Jesus is talking directly to Simon. And now he turns his gaze to this woman who's at his feet. And he looks directly at her. And yet he's talking to Simon. Now, that's kind of odd, right? Has anybody ever done that to you where they look at you, but they're talking to somebody else? It's kind of like, I kind of feel that, that's a little weird, you know, but this is what's going on. He's looking at this, this lady and, uh, and he says, Jesus turned toward the woman and said to Simon. Now, I th in my mind, if that were to happen, I could imagine she's, her, her heart is pounding. She's anxious and nervous, maybe a little fearful, maybe a little shy but also knows that she's deeply loved. He says, do you see this woman? Now, Simon didn't see her. All he saw was an object of derision, uh, an object of contempt, an example of immorality. But Jesus saw her. He says, I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears. Now, he put it, the, the bar on the lowest rung. You didn't even give me a basin of water. That would still be considered offensive. Go wash your own feet. It's not easy to wash your own feet. So he goes, you didn't even do that. He goes, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. And you did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little loves little. So he says, you know, you didn't give me a kiss. There's not even one on the cheek. Nothing completely dismissed me because you didn't anoint my feet with just common oil. She gives me her very, very best that she has and pours this perfume out. Then Jesus said, then Jesus says to her, now he's speaking to her. So he's looking at her, talks to Simon. Now he speaks to her. He says, then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, who is this? Even who forgives sins, Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you, go in peace. So these words of affirmation, very important. He speaks right to her and he says, your sins are forgiven. I believe that her heart just exploded with love and forgiveness to know that, you know, to hear those words, all that stuff I've done, all the shame, all the, the mistakes, the internalized agony. She goes, Jesus says, it's all forgiven. It's all forgiven. And then this departure phrase is very, very important in ancient cultures. It is really today too in the Middle East culture, how you, how, how, uh, you release somebody, how somebody goes. And you know, Simon wouldn't have done it, so he says, go in peace. With Shalom, he says, go in peace. Now Jesus addresses this, see, he has this story. It's a true story. You have like two ends of the continuum. At least it appears this way. You know, you have this Pharisee. He's all, you know, righteous and holy. So at least people thought. And then you have this prostitute, this sinful woman. And, and then he gives this example about this debt being forgiven. And he says, who loves more? And, you know, it's whoever's been forgiven more. But, you know, it's people misunderstand what Jesus is saying. Some people think, that, oh, what Jesus is saying is, is that, that he came for the people that have really messed up their lives. That if, you're, that if you didn't do a whole lot, you're, 
you're probably fine. You just need a little sprinkle or something. You know, you don't need a whole bunch. But this is not at all what Jesus is saying. See, the response of love is the recognition of how much debt is forgiven. The Pharisee just didn't know. He wasn't, he wasn't in that place. Really what needed to happen was is that Pharisee needed to be at Jesus' feet as well, crying for what, his, for what he's done wrong, his sin, how he's treated people poorly, the things how he's offended God. He should be weeping and doing the same thing. He's not. He's over there with his arms crossed. He's over there in the corner. See, there's grace that God gives for a wounded heart. But you know, God gives grace for a hard heart also. And in my experience, and what I see in the Bible is, is that the hard heart needs more grace than the wounded heart. Somebody who's wounded is often very tender. There's contrition going on. There's, there's kind of a recognition of our own, our own uh, foul, foul, uh, faulty mechanisms, things we've done wrong. There's, and, and certainly God does pour out grace for that. But when we're hard, we no longer see the value in people. We have relationships that are all stiff. There's all this anger. There's judgmentalism going on. Those things crush us. They certainly crush other people. They distance us from God's grace. But see, God's open. He, he's willing to give it. But we've got to be recognized. See, he just didn't recognize it. He didn't recognize what he needed. But he certainly needed a truckload of grace in his life. And there's grace for that. There's grace for that. You know, I, I, Jesus taught about servanthood over and over throughout his life. At the very end, the, the night before he's crucified, we see it appear again where there's now another foot washing kind of gone wrong. Jesus has assigned some people to prepare, some of his disciples to prepare a meal that would have been included in the responsibilities, foot washing. But in the meal, this last supper, they're in the middle of the meal and nobody has w taken the responsibility to, to wash anybody's feet. And so Jesus does it. He stands up. He takes off his outer garment. He puts on this towel around him. And then he gets a basin of water and he starts to wash each of the disciples' feet. And then it says, then at the end, he says this, do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them, you call me teacher and Lord and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I've set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. So we, it's part of what we do. You see a need, it's time to step up and serve. And that's the way we love on people. So who are you going to serve this week? You're going to be thinking about, looking for opportunities. I want to serve. It might be just a few times. It might be a lot all in one day. You can serve in your own home. When my, Sharon's language of love is words of affirmation. But when our kids were really young, at one point we had three kids under four years old. We had, all of them were in diapers. And in those times, it, it really acts of service meant a lot to her. That was a, and a language of love to her, like it would be to probably most, you know, most people in that situation. And I didn't always make the connection that when I served in our home like that, that it actually, you know, Sharon interpreted it as love. So one time she just told me, she goes, Andy, you need to understand when I see you vacuuming, that makes me feel cared for. You know, when I see you doing the dishes, it makes me feel romantic. You know, she goes, when I see you bathing the kids, it makes me have desire for you. So with those guys, I was bathing the kids three, four times a day. <laughs> yeah, I come home at 1030 at night, kids out of the bed. <laughs> Sharon, come watch, look them. <laughs> but uh, kids are older now, so I lost my secret weapon. All I've got is a dog, and that doesn't seem to work, you know. Sharon, come watch. I'm bathing the dog. But it is a language of love. When we communicate through acts of service, that says you are loved. And when we do it 
for the Lord, we're communicating God loves you. God loves you. This is why we want we, we want to always be serving. We want a culture of service. We want that all throughout our church. When people come in, they get served. I mean, and they just, you know, hey, where's the kids ministry? Let me show you. Where's the youth ministry? Let me show you. Let me, let me help you find a seat. Let me, let me be here to help you make things of, so that you can, you can experience God through a loving touch of service. Now, together, we're going to all join together all three services, and we're going to do it this Saturday from 9 to 12. 9 to 12 on serve day, which is why we're going to be all wearing our red shirts. You're going to get one as you're leaving your red shirt. You come in, we're going to just all go and serve. And I, there's an app. If you go to your app store and just type in serve day, it's a, it looks just like this. It's a big red icon that says serve. Download that. It gives you all, all of the things we're doing, all our small groups are doing. Some of the things we're doing is, is a mobile shower for the homeless. We have something for the first responders of Virginia Beach. We're serving a water down at the ocean front for the locals. We're doing a military appreciation and doing packages for active military. And then if you are not in a small group or you're not sure how to use the app or any kind of unclarity, just be here at 9 a.m. in this, right here in this auditorium, 9 a.m. And then we're going to all just walk over to Mount Trashmore and we have a bunch of projects we're going to be doing, helping out at the, you know, cleaning Kids Cove and doing some face painting and serving hot dogs and cleaning the skate park and uh, doing a, a number of things, just cleaning up Mount Trashmore in general. And we're just going to go around for, th you know, and if you can only come for an hour, too, that's fine. But just from 9 to 12 next, this coming Saturday, okay? That's something we can do. We rally together and we're saying, you know what? Let's serve our community. Let's demonstrate the love of Jesus, and we'll do it together. Okay, let's bow our heads and pray. Well, Lord, I pray for a serve day that people would be touched. Maybe even just the smallest act of kindness, they would sense the deepest touch of Jesus. Lord, I pray for those who have a broken heart. Some of you here, Maybe you're online. You might have, be in a place in life where you, your heart's broken. And I pray for God's grace to go out to you. That you would be able to feel God's grace, his love, his forgiveness, the renewal, the sense of promise, if your dream, if you've let go of your dream or your dream's been suffocated, suffocated or crushed. And if that's you, I want to pray for you, Father. I just pray for those who have broken dreams that are attached to their broken heart. Lord, I pray that you would, your sunlight would break through those dark clouds. you'd comfort them, know that you're with them in the boat, in the storm. They're not doing it alone. Lord, I pray that you'd give each person here with a broken dream wisdom of how to go forward, courage to do it, and faith. Some of you are leaders or your bosses, or you're, you're in some place where you have people in your life that, and you need to be serving. The world would say, no, they serve you. But Jesus says it's not like that. You are to serve. If you're in a partnership with somebody, a relationship, and you feel like you're doing all the serving, and you're being taken for granted, or even taken advantage of, I believe God wants you to have some, maybe a courageous conversation or two. You confront that. You're not meant to be a doormat. That is not what we're talking about today. We're talking about serving in Jesus' name, just extending the love of God. And then for those of you who have a hard heart, sometimes it's hard to even recognize that. 
or when you're stiff towards other people, you have you struggle with extending grace for people, extending forgiveness. You more than anybody needs God's grace. And when you receive God's grace, you'll find your heart will start to soften. I'm going to pray with you right now as we close. Would you say, God, give me your grace. Whether you have a hard heart or whether you have a broken heart, God, flow your grace into my life. Thank you for the kind, tender, courageous words of Jesus. If you've never asked to be a follower of Christ, just say today, God, I want, and he says, come follow me. All those who are weary and burdened. And he goes, I will give you rest. You say, God, I want to come to you today. I put my faith in Jesus. Do that right now. Just say, I put my faith in Jesus. Show me what that means. Help me to walk this out. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for tuning in to today's message. If God is impacting your life through this ministry, join us in reaching others by investing today. You can give by texting your donation amount to 757-230-2110 or by going to vineyardchurch.com slash give. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an update. We'll see you next week.